Okay, I think I am going to make a start and assume that um, it's better that we start at reasonably on time. We're only a few minutes over. Um, and to, to start by uh, introducing uh, myself, um, I've, my name is Giz Watson. I'm a former member of the Greens in the Parliament here in the state of Western Australia and um, currently working mostly on forest conservation issues. And I've been asked to facilitate. Um, so this is a great topic for us to discuss. Um, the um, order of events will be when I've just done these housekeeping things, um, I'm going to ask BK if he would kindly do us a, um, an Indigenous welcome, um, just to give you the heads up there, BK. Um, and we are um, working from a run sheet that gives... Um, all speakers um, approximately 10 minutes each. Um, if there's a bit of run over, we can cope with that. Um, so the order of speakers will, after BK has given an introduction, will be uh, B and Pete, um, an overview of regenerative agriculture. And then um, Zach Weiss, uh, Weiss, sorry. Is that correct? Zach Weiss, not Weiss? Weiss, you're right, spot on. Weiss, uh, my German's a bit, Rusty. Um, I will speak next and then we'll have a Q&A session. Um, then we'll go to uh, a B and Pete again with a short video, followed by Davinda and BK and Diane, and then we'll do some more Q&As. I will um, let you know when you're getting close to your time limit. Um, I'll say you've got two minutes to go and we'll try and um, run to time. Um, then we, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have finished at that point. Um, Michelle will speak about uh, follow-up actions and then B and Pete will show another short video and we'll wrap um, after about an hour and 45 minutes. When we get to the Q&A session, um, could people please use the uh, hands up um, mode if they are familiar with that or put their name in the chat box and I will um, call you when it's your turn to ask a question. Um, I encourage people to have their videos on if they can. Um, it makes it more, um, in, you know, feels like we're actually all together um, virtually, if not in, in, in the flesh. Um, I am going to introduce each speaker just before they speak rather than do the, doing them all at the beginning. And um, I, uh, I think it's just worth touching on what we're aiming to do in this session. Um, as is in the notes, this session will introduce participants to the principles of regenerative agriculture and ecological farming. Why it is an important approach for increasing biodiversity and limiting climate change and present practical present practical examples of its use in a number of international contexts. Participants will gain a deepened understanding of approaches to farming and agriculture that support rather than harm biodiversity and efforts to limit global climate change. So that's what we're hoping to uh, achieve this morning. Uh, well, it's this morning in WA. Um, can I give a special thanks to our participants from uh, um, India and um, Nepal who uh, have got up early to do this? Um, and it's obviously cold in Nepal. So um, I'm going to um, give the floor to um, BK for a two minute welcome, uh, Indigenous welcome. BK, over to you. Thank you so much. Namaste. Good morning to all of you. I'm just getting up. <laughs> uh, I'm welcoming you from the Himalayan kingdom of Nepal, the land of Christian mother nature the land which consists of more than 40% indigenous nationalities out of total population. Honorable facilitator Giz Watson, organizer Michelle Sather, eminent speakers Beatrice Ludwig and Fred Dawson, Devinder Sarma, Jack Wiss, Diane Evers, distinguished guests, my dear grand friends from across the globe, a very warm welcome to all of you at this session. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you today as one of the members of indigenous communities of Nepal. I was born and brought up in a remote mountainous village 
not only playing with friends from indigenous nationalities, but also swimming in rivers, flowing down through Mount Everest. From, from my childhood, as one of the members of indigenous communities, I learned that our mother nature is God. We should pray her, respect her, and protect her. At this great moment, I also would like to acknowledge and pay my great respects to all the fighters who are struggling hard for indigenous people's rights and rights of mother nature. This is probably the first virtual conference in the history of Global Greens. I say this session in particular has also been historic in the sense that this session in the beginning has honored indigenous people like me and fighters. Now, I really feel proud of myself being one of the family members of Global Greens. It has been, it has been proved that Global Greens is the only one global institution in the entire world which really cares indigenous people, which cares mother nature, which really and fairly cares the children like us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, BK. That's lovely. I really appreciate um, your words and uh, um, <laughs> yeah, it takes me right back to Nepal. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Now, uh, we are doing very well for time here, which is great. Um, and I will introduce our first two speakers, um, B. Ludwig and Peter Dowson from Friendly Farms. And I am going to just do a little introduction to them. Uh, Beatrice Ludwig is a lawyer and a regenerative agriculture advocate, having worked in Switzerland and Australia. As a co-founder of the Friendly Farms, of Friendly Farms, she's been on a journey to meet leading pioneers of regenerative agriculture and experts on climate recovery from around the world. She's also a founding director of the Australian Landscape Science Institute and a director with Gene Ethics. Pete Dowson is a filmmaker and regenerative storyteller also from Australia in New South Wales. Sydney-born media producer who makes regenerative agriculture films for positive change. Pete has documented many pioneers and practitioners of regenerative agriculture serving to grow the movement around the world. A co-founder of Friendly Farms, Pete has a passion for sharing the message, healthy land, healthy food, healthy people. Over to you, Beatrice and Pete. Thank you, Giz, and thank you, Michelle, for inviting me, and thank you, everyone else. We feel really privileged to be here. As we start, we'd like to invite you all to tell us in the comments section, what does regenerative agriculture mean to you? And so, yeah, thanks for the intro, Giz. My name's Pete and- My name is Beatrice. And you're right, we created uh, Friendly Farms 10 years ago, and it's a- It's a not-for-profit to, to promote uh, regenerative agriculture and support farmers in, tr in transition. And yes, for us, uh, regenerative agriculture means healthy land, healthy food, and healthy people. And after exploring this for like 10 years or more, um, we can now confidently add to that with healthy climate to, the, to this equation. We are on Gadigal land here. Uh, the mural that you can see behind us here is uh, a visual acknowledgement of that we're on Gadigal land. And it's by Indigenous artists Jason Wing and Maddie Gibbs. And we acknowledge the Gadigal people, any Indigenous people joining us from around the world. And thank you so much for that wonderful welcome from Nepal. And we um, acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging because they're all here with us right now, whether we perceive it or not. Regenerative agriculture has been a personal journey of discovery that has taken us from the fields of Machi to the high Tatras of Slovakia, which is in this picture. And along the way, we've been telling lots of stories in a form of like short, sharp, shareable films. And you can find all of those on the Friendly Farms Network YouTube channel. And I'll put a link in after our chat here. So you can find loads and loads of films about um, different pioneers and uh, practitioners of uh, regenerative agriculture. We started out by learning all about permaculture, and we've got Aidan Bender in this picture as a young farmer. He says, he says, imagine you're walking through the Garden of Eden. We could be living in a world of profusion and without scarcity. Then I traveled to India 
to study agroecology with Dr. Vandana Shiva. Vandana Shiva said in 2015, agriculture means the culture of the land. Any activity that destroys the land, the soil, the biodiversity, the water, creates greenhouse gas emissions, kills our bees, our butterflies, and our pollinators, is no longer agriculture, it is war. We need to reclaim agriculture, and through agriculture, we will reclaim the future of humanity. My next uh, stop was in Machi, where I studied holistic grazing. Holistic management, uh, and Ian Chapman, the man that you see here as a farmer, he says, holistic management is not just grazing management or land planning. planning. It is looking at our whole context and managing the resources and tools that we have to get to where we want. By taking our foot off the throat of nature, we are letting her respond. And um, we realized that here in Australia, even learning all of these things, exploring all of these different ways of uh, doing regenerative agriculture, that there is lots of missing pieces. Um, for starters, we're a really dry country, flat country. Um, we've got a unique backstory and there are different biogeomorphic principles at play. And you can Google that hashtag later. Um, so we went and met with Peter Andrews, a regenerative farmer and his son, Stuart, and their families to learn about natural sequence farming and how we can rehydrate and restore landscapes by applying the principles that you can find embedded in the Australian landscape and we collectively known as the Australian landscape science. Yeah, natural sequence farming is all about rehydrating the landscape with all plants. And Peter Andrews says, I quote, if we got 30% of the world changing their agricultural practices, we'd be carbon negative in 10 years or less. So what happens when we start to mix and match? I mean, these are just a few little applications of regenerative agriculture in the whole broad spectrum. What happens when you start to mix and match those ingredients together, like biodynamic, holistic, uh, permaculture, natural sequence farming? And what happened when we met with this farmer, Martin? Well, first of all, Martin told us about the story when the fires came through. Um, the, the, the fire fighters were literally coming in with their um, planes and taking water from his land while the river um, nearby was empty. So these practices, natural sequence farming, make a real difference. Um, but we also realized that we haven't really been meeting any indigenous uh, people. So we're really blessed to be invited down to Black Duck Foods Farm um, and meet with them there. A quote that came from that story, and these are all stories that you can find on our YouTube channel, and I'll put that link up after this. But um, And that was from Nathan Ligon in the centre of the picture here, and he was that we're not growing anything here as Indigenous agriculture. Mother's doing all of that, and we're just helping her along, and I really, really love that. Um, and that's, that's been a missing um, conversation in the conversation. So regenerative agriculture is all of these things that we mentioned, and there's many books to read about it and, and much more. Um, and people to meet. Uh, and there is a UN framework called Nature-Based Solutions that would embraces um, agroecology or regenerative agriculture and all its different um, forms. And it leads to the question, what might, a, uh, what might it look like if we scale all of the nature-based solutions to a global level and that that raises the question that i'll ask to everyone here in the room what might a nature-based civilization look like and if you want to learn more we have a webinar series and we would like to invite you all it's free uh, monday on monday at 6 30 reading your landscape you can find it on our website or on this link that we've just posted this i will post it up yeah and for us in summary regenerative agriculture is all about healthy land healthy food and healthy people, and of course, healthier climate. And our resources, you can find at friendlyfarms.org.au and at tiles.org.au. And- um, uh, Speaking of tiles. Yeah, we, we, there is uh, much more that we can talk about, but we better uh, just show you a video that summarizes what talk, the Australian Landscape Science Institute is about. Cue video, Nick, following the blueprint of the Australian landscape, please. Or one moment, please. We can manage climate recovery 
And there is a plan in this landscape that shows us that at any scale that can be achieved. The sky's the limit. My name is Peter Andrews. I've been involved in identifying how this landscape has worked for pretty well all my life. And I can guarantee today that the Australian land managers could lead the world if we understood what this landscape has to offer. I'm convinced that that's the case. I've gone around and built as many examples as I possibly can. So we're talking absolutely the blueprint this landscape contains. Australia is the comeback king from desertification. It's the oldest, the flattest, and has the least amount of natural water system. It doesn't have a lake in the centre or anything like that. And so everything about it would suggest that it should have been a desert, and of course it was. But the plants showed how it could be recovered, and we had megafauna on this land with no real beneficial climate backup. And so there is a story written in the landscape, no question. We've drained 94% of our wetlands. Then when we conduct agriculture, we create deserts of land, large areas of land. So it's necessary we do something to at least get that function back. The Australian wetlands always had water slowly moving and it was described as a stepped diffusion system of broadacre hydroponics by a very good scientist. Fundamentally, it's managing water, filtering the losses that would normally occur and returning them to the high point so that gravity in the sun can manage it all again. And one of the models we have shows that agriculture can be a fully functioning wetland if you design it correctly and follow the rules we've just been talking about. Reading the landscape is not much different than reading a book. You have to know the language. And then of course, it's quite easy in my opinion, but I believe it is so critically important that we identify what this landscape can tell us and teach people how they can take advantage of those bits of information. For those good souls, well-meaning, desperately trying to do something with the climate, what we've got now is the evidence of how it was, the evidence of what's gone wrong, and in many cases, the solutions. Then Peter. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for running so well to time. That's excellent. Um, always a challenge uh, in these circumstances. And thanks to the techs. For Nick, for getting that uh, working so well. All right. <clears throat> um, next, we will hear from Zach Wies. Uh, and I will just give an introduction. Um, so uh, Zach is from the United States. He is uh, the founder and president of Elemental Ecosystem. And I have to just move this over here out of the way so I can read it. Um, blending a unique combination of systems thinking, empathy and awareness, Zach created Elemental Ecosystems to provide an action oriented process to improve human relationships with their landscape. Protégé of the revolutionary Austrian farmer, Sef Holzer. Zach is the first person to earn Holzer's Practitioner's Certification directly from Sef through a rigorous two-year apprenticeship working on projects in North America and Europe. Welcome, Zach. You have the floor. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me here. What an awesome film that was. Thank you. Um, Pete and Beatrice for sharing that. And my talk is actually going to echo on that and how these stories of water are so important for us in terms of understanding what's going on with our climate. And for me, regenerative agriculture, successful regenerative agriculture, really comes down to changing our relationship with water and nature. Uh, we have this very destructive relationship with both of these. And water is the lifeblood of our earth. It's uh, the source of life on this planet. And it's so important, yet we turn our rivers into our garbage men. Um, and so this concept of the full water cycle, I'm sure you've all heard of the water cycle, but what we learn is a really simplified version. 
So as water turns from a liquid to a vapor, comes inland, it actually needs a nuclei to precipitate into a droplet and then rain. And so these are salts, these are ice crystals, but also for a lot of the world, these are actually microorganisms grown within the trees, grown within the forests that are hygroscopic. So they attract this water vapor, it forms a droplet, it forms rain, and then that phase change of water creates low pressure, and it actually creates this conveyor belt of moisture called the biotic pump. So 50% of the rainfall we receive is water that's transpired locally and then has been precipitated by forests. So these vegetative cycles are really important with actually moving water through Earth's continents. Not just that, but in the shaded soil, that water can infiltrate into the ground. It recharges the aquifers. It feeds springs. It feeds rivers. And you have this clear, consistent, healthy water moving through the system, making for a really stable, abundant climate. Now, what do we humans do to that? We create the watershed death spiral. We drain the wetlands. We create hard surfaces. We create roads. We take all of that water and run it downstream, creating floods, but then also creating droughts because the water that used to infiltrate into that healthy soil can no longer. And so we get droughts, we get fires. As that soil gets very hot and dry, its ability to hold the moisture reduces. And this is a feedback loop that gets worse and worse. Not only that, but you get high pressure heat domes rising off all of these bare earth. And it actually increases the pressure of those Hadley cells along the coast. So you get it resisting the inflow of cool, moist air, um, but then eventually that power is so forceful that it overwhelms. You get these huge flooding events, bigger than ever before, with longer periods of drought in between. So this is what that looks like. If we look at water flow through the system in the concrete versus the vegetated landscape, in the concrete landscape, all of that flow happens all at once. It pulses through the system and then very quickly it's dry. So there's no photosynthesis, there's no flow in the rivers because all of that water is running away. And not just that, the earth is heating up and as it heats up, its ability to absorb radiation is increasing. So it's getting hotter and hotter. That water vapor that used to condense and fall as rain is now forming a warming haze holding in that heat overnight. Now, by comparison, in the vegetated landscape, some of that water is runoff, but a much smaller proportion. It infiltrates into the ground, it feeds into the soil, and it slowly flows through the system. Not just that, but you have trees as they transpire, cooling the air, 590 calories per gram, this incredible amount of cooling, cooling the air and actually transporting that into the upper atmosphere to then condense again, release that atmosphere, release that heat, and this is how our planet cools. So in the first scenario, we're creating flood, we're creating erosion, we're creating drought and fire. And so flood comes with risk, comes with cost, comes with insurance, comes with finance. And then because we've designed the flood, we're doing the same thing with the drought. And there we have erosion, risk, cost, finance. It's making a situation that's not tenable, that's not viable for farmers. So if we look at that on the ground, this is Manahata. New York City under indigenous stewardship and under colonial stewardship. Now in the indigenous worldview, everything has purpose, everything has value, it's all part of the same whole. In the colonial view, everything has resources and energy to be extracted. And it's insane to me that these colonized people around the world, all of us really, are extracting the resources from our own land for the betterment of someone else so that this elite wealthy class can just get richer. And so you can see really clearly just with your eyeballs, the difference in these landscapes. So it's putting our communities in crisis. It's creating flood, it's creating drought, it's creating fire. We call these natural disasters. There's nothing natural about these. These are the direct result of our management decisions. And when you look at the world, in just 10,000 years, human activity has desertified one third of all of Earth's land. So that's a huge transformation in a really short period of time through this watershed death spiral. But that's only part of the story. This is all reversible. It's not only preventable, we can actually reverse it when we start working with water. So how do we do this? We transform watersheds into water catchments. We've made all of our catchment areas drain the water down as quickly as possible, creating eutrophication, creating flood. We need to turn those areas into water catchments where that rain is stored and fed into the earth. 
So this is what we're teaching people to do with water stories. If, if this is interesting to you, check out waterstories.com. We're going to be highlighting films, animations about the water cycle, and eventually leading to a course to train practitioners to do this very thing. So this is one project in Portugal. This is the before, this is the after. This is the same exact landscape, just using natural techniques and strategies. This is just with the rain from the sky. And now this community has gone from being water scarce to being water abundant. Similarly, my mentor Sepp Holzer's place in Austria is just this beautiful example. It's like the Garden of Eden on this steep mountainside farm that was thought to be valueless land. And then you can look at examples like Dr. Rajendra Singh in India, where they've actually revived rivers. They brought rivers back to life using these same techniques. So again, this is a before and after image. This is the Kairul uh, region where this community was out of water. They drilled 27 borehole wells, all came up dry. They were only able to grow nine hectares of agriculture. They built one water body for the same cost and they went from nine hectares to 650 hectares. They, their increase in agricultural productivity paid for the cost of the water body the first year four times over. So this community went from being really water scarce to water abundant and it changed their quality of life. It changed how women are spending their time. It changed girls actually going to school because now they didn't have to carry water all day. But what's really amazing is they reduced the temperature two degrees Celsius in this region. So they have already offset our anticipated warming from climate change by decentralized water retention, by holding the water, by restoring the vegetation. So they've reduced that temperature two degrees and they've gone from 2% greenery to 48% greenery. They've revived seven rivers to perennial flow, bringing water back to 250,000 wells that were dry, impacting a million people, causing the reverse migration from the cities back to the country. Zach, so I'm just gonna jump in and say, sorry, we, we are going to have to wind up shortly just to keep to time. Yep, I'm almost at the end. I'm like one second. Good on you, thanks, mate. Perfect. perfect. Um, so we can do this all around the world. We can see that the Amazon is this biotic pump and all around the world, we can create a really positive impact. So if this is interesting to you, come check out waterstories.com. This is where we're sharing these stories. This is where we're going to be sharing these films because there's a really positive narrative to be shared when we take our myopic thinking away from just carbon centered and actually start looking at water as well. Thanks very much, Zach. Is that you done there? Yep, that was it. Thank Good you. you. Thank you. you. You were pretty much spot on there for time. So again, appreciate people keeping to time. That's uh, it's a, quite a discipline in this sort of uh, complex topic. Um, I'm just uh, um, now going to move to some Q&A. Um, I have had a quick look at um, the um, chat box to see if there are questions already arising, but please put your questions in there now. Um, and we will have uh, about 10 minutes for Q&A and reminding people that um, you this session is being recorded. And um, if you indicate that you want to speak by putting up your hand in, the, in that, uh, I don't know how I'm going to see that. Nick, but anyway, um, maybe you can tell me if I'll see that. Um, and I will give you the call. So um, I, having just scanned through the chat, I noticed that um, there was a query from Tyrone Delaney. Delaney. Tyrone, did you have something you would like to um, to say? I'm, I read your comment in the chat as a bit of a question. Uh, and tech support, I might need to have a heads up how I unmute people. Or so Giz, if you open the participants list. Yes. Uh, there should be two tabs, one for panelists and one for attendees. Uh, then if you can find yep. the uh, name yep. in yep, the yep, attendees yep. list and select allow to talk. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to check in with Tyrone because I thought it was a question possibly uh, you might like to ask. Where have you gone on my list? Yes, mm. I'm happy to speak. Good. Good on you. Go for it. 
Uh, yes, so I'm I'm interested in the different perspectives around agriculture and how we can move away from fossil fuel based and chemical based um, intensive agriculture. Um, primarily, I guess my concern is that we have, you know, 9 billion people approximately on the planet. Um, much of the Earth's population don't have access to adequate food. Um, how do these uh, ideas and, and practices go in terms of yield? Um, you know, we want to be maximising the yield that we get from land so that we can provide everyone with, with the food that they need. And um, some resources have already been provided in chat. So I guess that's a question for everyone to discuss. Thanks. I might go first to B and Pete if you'd like to respond and then I'll come to Zach. Um, yes, thanks for the question. Um, so there has been, um, the UN um, has actually confirmed that agroecology is superior to industrial agriculture in terms of yields. Um, there's a report, Wealth Per Acre by uh, Navdanya, Dr. Vandana Shiva has put it together. So yeah, it's a matter of, uh, really the main problem is subsidies. Subsidies are being given by governments in the billions uh, to agro industry, um, we need to shift subsidies to, to the people on the ground. We have the solution, we can have climate recovery and we can have, um, uh, yeah, we can have healthy food production. We, uh, if, if there's a policy shift, we can do it on the ground ourselves, but it would really help if, help if policies were shifted and subsidies were shifted. And yields are much better with um, polycultural um, regenerative agriculture than they are for monoculture. You can get so much more out of stacked and layered um, uh, landscapes. We waste so much food and already, so we can look in that. We can feed more people than we're currently feeding. In fact, look at the waste. There's actually not so much of a population feed to population. It's a narrative put out there primarily by industrial um, you know, GM crop. Uh, driven um, lobbyists. Also, you have to take into account the uh, desertification. So monocultures last for a little while and then that's it. And then the not-for-profits kick in and do the restoration for free. Yeah. Thanks, B. Um, I'll just check with Zach and then I have another question. I'm going to let Kerry Gill know that you are the next question. Yeah, you know, for, in my experience, the, uh, regenerative agriculture is actually much more productive, three to 10 times plus. If you think of growing a field of corn versus a field of 10 different things, your actual productivity per acre skyrockets. The issue here is that you can't drive one tractor over a thousand acres and turn it all into profit. Um, so the reason that we have this industrial agriculture system has to do with our distribution systems, our harvesting systems. So in terms of productivity, regenerative agriculture is by far and away better than industrial in terms of one person managing a thousand acres and making a bunch of money off of it. It's not as strong. Thanks, Zach. Okay, I'm going to go to Kerry. You're, you have the call. Kerry Gill should be, you should be unmuted to speak now, I hope. Ah, can you hear me now? All good. All good. You can hear me? Good. Sorry, yep. I haven't got my yep. uh, no, you're good. camera. I'm at home with COVID at the moment, so uh, just been watching and listening. But um, it's a really interesting discussion because I've been looking at Australian policies around agriculture and food security recently. Um, and... Ironically, it seems the farmers themselves in Australia are very keen to adopt agri uh, regenerative practices, even if they're not calling themselves regenerative farmers. Um, there seems to be a widespread sense from groups like the National Farmers Federation, Farmers from Climate Change, that regenerative practices are needed, but that the incentives and the rewards are not there because all the policies at the moment particularly at federal and, and mostly at state level, are, are geared around maximising yields of high value crops that we can export in bulk, monocrops um, that can boost exports. And I'm just not sure what we can do in terms of like 
arguing for better policies. So what what does this look like as from a you know political party? What sort of policies can we get up, and what sorts of barriers do we face? Um, from okay, I'm going to just stop you off there because we've only got two minutes before we go back into the next speaker. Um, can I suggest a, a brief response from B and Pete and then Zach and note that um, Diabas will uh, no doubt be talking about these sort of issues as a, a former member of the parliament and uh, the challenges of getting um, policy uh, changes and others from the Australian Greens might be also have things to say. Okay, um, so B and Pete, would you like to respond to that? Um, Zach, would you like to say something? Because we don't have much time. Yeah, yeah, I can chime in there. I, you know, I would say the biggest single thing, and this might be unpopular, stop farming subsidies. If you stop them all together, you make the population pay the true cost of food. This is going to naturally level itself out because regenerative agriculture is more productive. It's more economically productive um, if you take subsidies out of the equation entirely. Thanks very much, Zach. That's excellent. And thank you uh, for the questions from the participants. And I encourage everybody, if you're not reading the chat, to read the chat. There's some good exchanges of information occurring in that space. Uh, excellent. So now uh, to keep us to time and move us along, um, the next item or the next point on the agenda is that B and Pete will show a short video. Uh, and uh, after that, we'll hear from Dev and BK. So um, B and Pete, it's over to you. Yeah, great. Thank you. And there's some great questions and answers um, going on there. The, we're just going to basically show another video. This one uh, featuring Martin Royds, who's a regenerative farmer from Braidwood. Uh, and yeah, it's interesting because it touches upon the economics of farming. So let's watch it. Nick, Nick. if you could play. <laughs> Thanks. Take us in. When I was a chemical farmer, we were slowly going broke. And actually the guy who did the figures said, you know, we're stuffed. Farming is finished in this area. We cannot survive with these figures. Now, every cost I spend is an investment for the future. And I want to get a hundredfold back for every investment I do. And I don't want to have to go back and redo it. You do it once, then you just manage it into the future and you're getting more and more and more back. It's not more and more on. Welcome to Jilmatong. Jilmatong's two and a half kilometres from Braidwood in the southern highlands of New South Wales. I went to university to learn about soil science, water systems, and I even got hoodwinked into the sales pitch and I was a chemical farmer for five years. I was a contract sprayer. I can remember I'd been out spraying serrated tussock. By the time I got home, I'd whirled up like a Michelin man. I just uh, had rashes and all that. And a woofer who was working on the farm came out and looked at me and she didn't recognize me. And she's going, is that Martin? And I went, yeah, I, th I think I poisoned myself. And yeah, that's when you sit down and go, I think I need to review all this. I had the chemical epiphany. So instead of going in and poisoning a weed, poisoning an insect, plowing a soil to try and get it down, you know, everything is giving back to the soil. So it's a process of I give back and I get tenfold back. And that's what nature does. Give and you'll receive. We see the exponential growth in everything. You know, you're planting a tree, it's going to give back for hundreds of years. You're designing a fence that's going to encourage the stock to move fertility up the hill. It's going to give back for 50 years. You're putting a contour channel in there that's going to slow the water down and a compost heap is going to give back for years. Putting weirs in the water to stop my erosion gully forever. So the economics, that's the stuff that really excites a lot of farmers when they come here and they're going, oh my God, 
Look at that exponential benefit you can get. And that is the power of when you start working with nature and nature starts giving back. And that's probably my biggest learning. Just, you know, that these epiphanies are still coming to me in this last year going, oh, the trees are giving. They're not expecting every seed to grow. They're just saying, here, have some of our abundance. Bring some of your fertility to us. Bring a fungus here, blah, 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 and we'll all make this lovely utopia. We asked a young person who just finished her university degree where she thought things were going. And the sad thing she said was, well, if we don't look at how we're going to survive on Mars, we're stuffed. And they're right, we have stuffed it, but we do have the knowledge of how to fix it and work with it. We just got to change that thinking, listen to the people, listen to the land. Healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. So easy. Thanks very much. That's excellent. Voila, as you say. Um, do, do you want to make any comment um, on the on the video? Well, I wouldn't like to say Martin Royce is actually a student of Peter Andrews, so he's put in these um, dams, um, not wetlands, more than dams, um, chains ponds, of ponds, chains of ponds, how the Australian the landscape actually looked like in the past and uh, recreated the functions, not exactly how it was, but the functions. And um, yeah, it, it really protected his farm during the, uh, during the fires that I mentioned that previously and also the neighboring farms because the helicopters were able to get water from the land there was still water flowing everything else was dry including the creek and a quick response to tyrone is what's being produced well he's got um chicken production uh, lots of eggs um cat beef cattle um just to start with tons of produce coming out of that it's a very productive he's a he's actually a really successful in fact they do economic case studies with martin on how viable um, regenerative farming can be and you can but find those studies online with this kind of agriculture we're talking this step diffusion system of broad acre hydroponics you can put anything on top so you could also have fruit trees etc it's just a more efficient effective system thanks very much i'm going to have to cut short there um, there's so much that we could uh, go into um, excellent um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker um, Devinda, uh, Devinda Sharma from India. Uh, Devinda Sharma is a distinguished food and trade policy analyst, an award-winning Indian journalist, writer, thinker, and researcher, well-known and respected for his views on food and trade policy. Trained as an agricultural scientist, he holds a master's in plant breeding and genetics. He's a strong voice for farmers' rights and providing farmers with dignity and pride. Um, welcome, Devinda, you have the floor. Sorry, Devinda, you'll need to unmute you. Gotcha. Thank you, Michelle. And, um, uh, you know, hello to everyone. I think it is such a wonderful thing to connect with the people who are wanting to save this planet and who are doing their best. I think uh, that is something remarkable, gives me a lot of energy for the day and uh, for the future. Well, uh, um, you know, in India, uh, as we all know, uh, we have just come out of a of a huge, huge protest by farmers, uh, which uh, lasted for over a year around uh, New Delhi. And uh, that protest, uh, that farmers movement was essentially for, uh, for ensuring um, uh, higher income or guaranteed income for farmers, a problem that farmers everywhere in the world are faced with and are struggling against. Uh, and I think uh, there are lessons here, but uh, coming to agroecology, I think that's another uh, important area which has been a, a focus in this country. In fact, uh, a few days back on February 1, uh, we have the budget being presented by the finance minister. Uh, that's a usual practice every year. And in this uh, budget, uh, why I'm mentioning this is because the finance minister has already announced that uh, in the Ganga, uh, region in the Ganga Basin in Uttar Pradesh in the northwestern part of the country. They're going to start with organic farming, uh, which uh, they would like to introduce in uh, a five kilometer corridor uh, along the Ganga River, uh, because they believe that is the way forward uh, to, uh, you know, they're not using the word agroecology, but uh, yes, that's a way to restore uh, the lands back into the status that they were earlier, and also to save the river 
because as we know, Ganga is also highly polluted. Uh, we heard our friend Zik telling us about uh, my friend Rajendra Singh, uh, about the amazing work uh, that he has done. In fact, there are lots and lots of um, such initiatives uh, in India, which gives us uh, hope and also have built up a strong community of people who would like now agriculture to transform, to transform from chemical to non-chemical agriculture. And these kinds of initiatives are happening across uh, the country, uh, small, some small, some big. But I thought I'd like to share with you a, 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 a one of the initiatives which I think is uh, perhaps the world's uh, biggest uh, agroecological model that we have today. And that's in the southern province of uh, Andhra Pradesh in India. Now, Andhra Pradesh uh, is uh, a state where I remember about uh, 12 years or 13 years back when I visited a tiny village, uh, these farmers had said that they have had enough of uh, chemical pesticides and fertilizer, and they wanted to shift uh, to uh, you know to to uh, natural farming systems because they believe the spate of suicides happening a destruction to the nature and so on which of course we all know uh, was the outcome of these intensive uh, farming systems and in andhra pradesh began a revolution from just a small village which now has spread to about uh, uh, more than 3700 villages and it is called the community managed natural farming systems and uh, this is now rated as one of the one of the uh, hopes uh, or beacons of hope for for the globe as far as the transformation is uh, concerned and in this uh, particular initiative as i said uh, uh, we have about uh, 700000 farmers who have already shifted from uh, chemical to non chemical uh, farming uh, and uh, the uh, if you look into the true cost accounting uh, done by the economics of ecosystem services or biodiversity as done by the united nations uh, team uh, they have worked out uh, that the gains uh, in this region have been phenomenal andhra pradesh is one state which thinks that uh, the entire uh, farming community would be transformed from chemical to non-chemical by the year 2030, and which is not far away now, but also let's not forget the number of farmers which needs to be transformed would be 10 times uh, more than what has already been done. Uh, so, you know, there are various uh, mechanisms they have adopted, uh, strategies and uh, so on. But interestingly, uh, the question that uh, normally crops up is what will happen to the crop yields? As I heard somebody also raised this here. Interestingly, in Andhra Pradesh, it has been found that the yields have actually gone up by 10 to 110 percent, depending upon which crop you are considering. And uh, so uh, the, the health costs have come down uh, dramatically from 55 to 60 percent in some cases about 80 percent in my visits to the villages what i find surprising is that the women uh, have joined hands so they are in fact the pivot uh, behind this entire initiative uh, more than 600,000 uh, self-help groups of women have been formed involving about 7 million uh, women and they are the ones who are supplying inputs uh, knowledge uh, disseminating technology and uh, so on when i say technology i'm talking about the alternate technology that is of course very important uh, because we cannot just uh, abandon these forms and leave it to 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 hope or to to you know to, to nature to take care of. So there are lots of initiatives being uh, taken care of here. And in fact, uh, in <clears throat> well, my last visit, when I talked to the farmers there, uh, and I asked them, what exactly do you need? Everywhere that I go, people would tell me they need money for this, they need money from this. To my, uh, to my surprise, when I went on telling them, coaxing them, please tell me, what do you need from this government? They said, nothing, just stop the liquor shops that are being opened around. You know, so that tells us clearly that the, the father, the, that the families are, are completely content um, with this kind of a farming system. And uh, in fact, there is no farmer suicide in these areas where non-chemical agriculture is uh, taking place or is in practice. It's strange uh, in a country where farmer suicides are a huge, huge issue, as we know about uh, 10 to 12,000 farmers commit suicide almost every year for the last uh, for the last 30 years or 25 years that we have data. And that clearly tells us that this is the farming system for the future. And uh, the, the, as, as I said earlier, <clears throat> 
the the emissions because the use of water and the use of energy has come down drastically the uh, the uh, emissions have also been uh, have come down and i think uh, that's the uh, model for a future now will that be expanded in the country or not i think there are a lot of um, uh, efforts being made to see that uh, this farming system what is called as community managed uh, natural farming is uh, expanded to or replicated in other parts of this country there are about uh, seven or eight uh, state governments uh, which have uh, taken up the same farming systems or are trying to introduce the same farming systems in their in their uh, areas and i think uh, that is the way forward but as uh, we all know and as has been discussed earlier that the agricultural subsidies that the or the support that comes from the governments actually go into the the intensive farming systems and there is a dire need to shift those kind of supports or or i would say create another kind of a support mechanism for agroecology for regenerative agriculture and uh, for natural farming systems and this is uh, possible and uh, I, you know this is something which is important even at the global level because we know uh, there are the, the subsidies the kind of total subsidies that go into uh, intensive farming systems is about 700 billion dollar every year out of which just 1% goes for uh, non chemical agriculture so yes i agree uh, as was said earlier <coughs> that <coughs> that there is sorry there there is a need to no need to see that these <clears throat> these subsidies are are uh, uh, you know taken away as far as intensive farming systems is concerned and then of course uh, we need to support or back up uh, uh, these kinds of initiative which try to restore agriculture or reclaim agriculture the way it should be and of course as uh, my friend vandana has often said it is a war against nature i call it as economic violence uh, the theory of economic violence and i think we have to move away from that and uh, to me the andhra pradesh model gives me hope because that's the kind of a scale uh, which of course convinces people because lots of time i have heard um, michel people telling me oh that's one village you talk you are romanticizing agriculture romanticizing this kind of a farming but when it is done in thousands and thousands of acres i think people start to believe that yes it is uh, possible so to uh, to add on i think uh, when we when we accumulate what has been done globally and what has been done nationally i think we are evolving or we are moving towards the uh, a food system that is for the future and of course as we all know uh, the 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 planet is getting destroyed and the area that i come from the food bowl of the country is a classic example of what we have done to to nature and to environment in fact there are lots of study which say punjab the food bowl of the country where i am based is a state which will uh, run out of water in the next uh, few years unless we change the uh, farming systems and i think that's a kind of a worry that everyone is concerned and i think the community managed natural farming systems with local adaptation is something that we need to uh, encourage and uh, uh, promote as much as uh, possible i'm glad the government of india is also thinking on those lines but let's not be very excited that the government um, is uh, the backup is there because the government's also backup intensive farming system so there's a conflict there but but nevertheless you know the more we start talking about uh, natural farming system the more we talk about uh, you know bringing areas or bringing projects like uh, the corridor 5 km corridor uh, around the ganga river basin i think is something that should be um, giving us uh, you know that uh, hope that in the in the days to come perhaps the governments uh, or perhaps the policy makers would uh, see merit in what we are talking about and will try to try to push that kind of a farming system elsewhere so that is a, a, a nutshell what is happening in india there are so much that i could have shared but i thought <clears throat> let me pick up the one a bigger uh, uh, model that has uh, evolved or that has developed over these last uh, few years and uh, that may pro perhaps provide us a, a you know an inclination or an uh, you know a hope that yes if it is possible in that particular scale it is possible to do it in a much bigger scale everywhere in the world uh, uh, thank you very much uh, michelle thanks uh, dev that's excellent and again thank you for sticking to time and uh, can I just say um, I find India an inspiration in terms of some of the politics around agriculture. It's uh, it's a very uh, inspiring some of the work that's being done there. Okay, um, I am going to go to uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, BK, and I'll just give you an introduction, BK. BK is a development thinker practitioner, 
For the past 15 years, he's taken the lead of several de developmental initiatives. Along with his team, he's empowered and supported more than 10,000 farmers, young men and women to start and grow an eco-friendly ag business by providing a range of entrepreneurial support services from counseling, training and mentoring to access to inputs and other business development services. He personally dreams of prosperous far farmers through sustainable agriculture, agri-entrepreneurship. -ent he is also a founding president uh, of the Nepali Greens. BK, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Once again, good morning from Nepal. Uh, actually, I'm not presenting any papers. I'm not presenting any videos. I'm just speaking on the basis of my experience that I've had for the past 15 years. I was born and brought up in rural areas of Nepal. If you are born and brought up in rural areas, then you'll have no options besides farming, you know. You have to walk on farmland for a whole day and entire year to grow crops. During that period, you have to take care of soil. You have to take care of crops you have to take care of water. You have to take care of cattle. You have to learn to properly manage cattle manure as well. And you have to learn from our family members and apply different production techniques on the farmland. Like most kids born in rural communities, especially in farming communities, I also experienced rural life and lifestyles especially the lifestyles of farming communities. I was a child, but I had to work with my parents, grandparents and other family members as a farmer. I mean, when I was a little kid and supposed to go to school to read A for apple, B for ball and C for cat, instead, I went to farmland to practically read A for agriculture. <laughs> It has been more than four decades. It has been more than four decades that agriculture is in my blood. Agriculture is in my heart. As a result, today, I'm with you as one of the speakers to speak on agriculture as an advocate and a practitioner. Nearly more than 15 years ago, I joined environmental activism in Nepal. We started inspiring so many people to protect environment and advocating for environmental conservation. While joining environmental campaign, I got an opportunity tra to travel several rural communities, several rural areas in Nepal. While spending my time in such rural communities, I found most of the communities without male farmers and young people. They were found to have left their soil, their land for Gulf countries especially in search of better employment opportunities, in search of better income. I also found that farmers were not interested at all in farming because of lower production and income. Their annual production was not enough to feed their families even for three months. They were not able to afford school education for their kids. At the same time, I also saw that most of the farmers were engaged in unhealthy farming practice. Most of all the farmers were using excessive amount of harmful chemical fertilizers and pesticides, harming their human health and natural environment. The most distressing thing was for me, the rural farmland was completely barren. Then we came up with a green action to inspire farming communities to adopt organic farming, you say. Initially, as a pilot project, we went to a small community, inspired some farmers in organic farming. They were initially motivated towards organic farming, but later on, they did not continue for long because of lower production and lower income. Despite the fact that they know well that this farming practice has so many benefits and positive aspects. Then we knew that unless and until farmers make better income, then they will not adopt any farming practices. So we came to a conclusion that farming should be both ecologically sustainable and economically sustainable. Then we came up with a different green action 
of empowering and supporting farming communities and young people to go more and on more by engaging in sustainable agriculture and agri entrepreneurship. This green action proved to be effective to some extent. In this session, we are glad to say that with our initiatives, thousands of farmers and young people are engaging in sustainable agriculture. Now, sustainable agriculture has helped in minimizing soil disruption. It has helped in improving soil health. It has helped in water conservation. It has encouraged in planting diverse crops. It has promoted biodiversity conservation. While adopting sustainable agriculture, the farmers are not using chem uh, harmful chemicals now. They are engaged in producing safe and healthy food. They are not only protecting their health, but also protecting agriculture workers' health from improper use of chemicals and pesticides while ensuring decent wages to them. It has promoted economic resilience too. This farming practice seems to be a win-win game, both for the people and nature. That's why we have come up with a dream of prosperous farmers, dream of prosperous young people, so that they will not be forced to leave their families, leave their little kids, and leave their motherland just for five US dollar per day. Now we are confident enough that we can achieve our dream of prosperous farmers and prosperous young people through a good agriculture practice, which we say sustainable agriculture or organic agriculture or regenerative agriculture. This is the only means which not only saves farmers from abject poverty, which not only saves young people from youth puberty and unemployment, but it also saves the entire natural world, which is our ultimate goal. Thank you so much. Thank you, BK. Appreciate uh, your contribution. And um, having visited some of the remote communities in Nepal, um, I'm, uh, yeah, was was fantastic to see some of these things in action. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Diane Evers, and I will give you an introduction to Diane. Um, and uh, after we've heard from Diane, we will um, uh, hear from Michelle and uh, B and Pete again, and then we, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, after Diane, we'll have the Q&A. Um, and so um, I have some questions I've noted in the chat, but if you have questions um, following on from <coughs> Diane's contribution, please put them in the chat. Okie dokie. So uh, Diane Evers is from Western Australia. She's a former Greens member of the state uh, parliament, the Legislative Council. She has worked extensively on regenerative agriculture and is a member of the country Greens in Australia. Diane will discuss policy ideas to encourage and support the growth of regenerative farming practices. Diane, you have the call. Great, uh, thank you, Giz. Um, I will share my screen because I wasn't exactly sure what issues people would raise and I thought I'd put them all together in PowerPoint. Bear with me, I'm an accountant, there's no pretty pictures. So can we see that? Or did I wait? My apologies. Not yet, Diane. No, I get it. Uh, there we go. How's that? That's working. Excellent. So I'm gonna actually go back to the beginning, just got the agriculture policy, uh, what we're talking about here. Now, we've heard a lot of great speakers. I appreciate everybody going on about that. First thing that I'll point out is um, one reason this is so good is because of the diversity, diversity for the landscape, diversity for the community, diversity for the, the food and nutrition we'll be getting. But also uh, carbon drawdown has become a big thing. And I'll talk more about that because that's what the government has picked up on. The 4p1000.org, have a look at it. It's from the Paris Agreement back in 2015. What that means is we can organize, if we can, sorry, uh, increase soil carbon by 0.4% in the, in the soil per year. Um, that's what we need to fix climate change. It's there in the soil. 0.4% is not a hard amount for farms to pick up on this. It's been done before. So we'll also reduce emissions because there's less tractor passes over the landscape. There's less um, putting on the 
the uh, chemical uh, biocides as well as the fertilizers. Gives you resilience to climate because of course your soil starts holding carbon, starts holding water. Better for animal welfare because they're a part of the system. They're not kept in you know, intensive farms, intensive piggeries and uh, cattle. The nutrition in food has also been shown to go up and the return to farmers from that diversity on their farm because they're not just growing a monocrop. And then you've got the health for the community and the people as well. Now what's inhibiting it? And I love the chats that's been going on. A lot of stuff has been picked up on there. We've got the big issue I think first is the, um, uh, the industry, the agrochemical industry is pushing governments to continue using lots of chemicals, to continue using biocides, to continue to looking at that big industry. But we've also got inertia. It's hard for those people who have been doing this for 30, 40 years to accept, maybe I should be doing a little bit different, particularly if they're in a nice comfortable job, whether that's in government, whether that's in, uh, in the departments, the services industry, whether that's in the research industry, they're quite comfortable there. So the existing policy that we've got is supporting the industry. It's supporting, I put abattoirs in there because it's supporting that big size scale. We want the big flow through. And their focus on carbon has been um, um, really, really difficult in a way because it, um, it, it gets people thinking that's all I have to do is put carbon in the soil and I'm done with it. But carbon is one of the benefits of regenerative agriculture. Uh, yes, and so I said the agriculture department, conservatism, their inertia, research funding comes from the industry. What would you expect? And then also we've got the conservative farming organizations. These are people, like I said, have been doing it for years. They don't see the reason to change and they're really hesitant. And they also have those connections to government keeping policy not good for us. Now, what we've got in current policies that aren't working, as I said, get big or get out. It's all on the monocrops. It's on the large enterprises. This is simple for government. It's much more simple for them to deal with one or two organizations than to deal with a hundred. Now, one thing I, I like from Devinda's presentation on India, you've got a lot more people connected to the landscape. And that connection helps people say, this is important. We want to change. We want to do it different. Here in Australia, very few farmers, very few people on the ground. It's not, a, um, it's not a social issue to the majority of people. All they want is the cheap food at the grocery store and that's it. And that's where we are having a, a, a difficulty in changing. And as I said, the carbon focus is a problem as well. And in our government, one of their policies has come out saying that whatever you do has to be additional to what you're already doing. So not only are they suggesting things that are not so good, but farmers have to pick these up who haven't been doing it before. So the farmers who have been working on this and doing really well for many years, many decades in some cases, who have carbon in their soil, they're getting nothing out of it. But of course, that's how it is. The people who are doing it well, they just keep doing it well. Um, we're still hoping to get more people into it. Now, these are just some of the examples in the current federal policy in Australia. This is some of the things that they're saying in order to increase carbon in your soil, we want you to do these things that you haven't been doing already before. Now, you'll see on that list, no-till. Now, most farmers pick that up. There are still a few here that burn their stubble. It's just outrageous. But no-till still leaves the ground pretty much bare. Um, stubble retention, there's even adding lime to the soil, which again, we do that in, in the area I live in as a regular course. These things, adding lime to your soil is not gonna increase your, your carbon. It may help you grow things in the first instance, change the pH and that. Uh, redistributing soil through the profile, they're actively saying to people, turn your soil over and mix it in. You know, Get some of the top stuff down to the bottom because they think that if you've got a few leaves and twigs and stubble on your surface of your soil, that all you gotta do is put it underneath the soil and then you've got carbon there. That is not the sort of carbon we're looking for. We're looking for resistant carbon, carbon that will last a thousand years. That carbon will be, it'll, it'll turn back into uh, CO2 probably within a year, maybe two. So what you need is the microorganisms in the soil turning that humus into resistant carbon. And that is a whole process that I'm really hoping everybody will be interested enough to learn more about as uh, you continue. Uh, 
So in our state policy, they're doing a little bit better. We have a minister who's cottoned onto this idea several years ago. She's pushing for funding for approved pro projects, uh, looking at land restoration as well. But it's still, you know, oh, we'll give 500,000 to one organization. And the rest of you farmers who are still struggling to figure out what this is and how you can do it, um, we'll just wait three years for that research to come back to say, oh yeah, it's a good idea. We, we've got to be doing more of those projects more quickly. And that's something that government has to work out. Also local government would be involved because of course they have zoning issues and they need to know that this is important. Now our desired outcomes from regenerative agriculture, from people pick, picking this up, we want more resilient soil. We want carbon in there. We want the water retention. We want a healthy microbiome. To do this, you've got to keep your landscape covered. So put cover crops that you may just turn back into the soil at the end of the season. And I want to make a point here um, with a lot of people in the chat have been talking about organic, but organic and regenerative are not the same. And in fact, in the US, they're trying to come up with a regenerative organic certification process. Because in organic farming, where you're not using any chemicals, some farmers still till their soil before planting into it, which kills the, the fungi, which kills the microbiome. You, you, you've got to try to disturb your soil as little as possible. And with regenerative agriculture, it's very much about no, no more use of fungicides or, pet or insecticides, herbicide use at a minimum if necessary. Some farmers are finding they don't have to after a while because they're doing so well with their cover crops out competing the weeds. So keep the soil undisturbed, undisturbed reduce the biocides. We need to do more water testing and soil testing because a lot of farmers will put fertilizers on their soil when they don't actually need it. They're, they're putting on more than what they need. They're putting it on every year because that's what they've done. If we can stop that, that additional herbicide, uh, that additional, uh, um, fertilizers, that's less tractor passes, that's less of the chemical fertilizers being produced, so many other things. And most of it is running into our waterways anyway. Um, Multi-species cropping and pastures, there's been tests done in Europe, and I wish I could remember the, remember the name of it right now, where they found the more different uh, um, families of seed you put in, as well as uh, species of each of those. So grasses and legumes and uh, cereals, whatever, mixing them all in there, the uh, productivity of the landscape increases with every new thing added. So you actually end up getting much more out when you have that diversity in your crops. The, yeah, it just, it just works. It just, it just makes sense. Um, also, uh, multi-species cropping and pastures. You can actually have a summer crop or a, um, a cover crop and then bring animals in because animals are a part of the system. We don't need to go meatless. We don't need to come up with uh, manufactured meats. We just have meat cat, um, animals as part of the system. They reduce the um, insect numbers. They increase the uh, the flow of the different soil types across the landscape, they fertilize it. It, it really works. And we have to work out with the methane, we find that uh, cattle in, in high intensity uh, situations do have a lot of methane. Out on grass fed cattle, there's less because there's microbes within the soil that react with that methane and break it down on site. It's not none, but you put them in a diverse landscape and they're much better at it. Yep, and then just reduce the monocropping. Now the suggestions, things that I'd like to suggest to governments, and this is a big discussion that we need to think more about and think in terms of the greens as well. They need to listen and learn to innovative farmers. A lot of those farmers are not making a big deal about it because they're just getting on with their business, but they're doing well. And if the agriculture departments and the government could listen to them, I think they would learn more. They've got to start thinking on a smaller scale because regenerative agriculture works better on a smaller scale where you can have that diversity in there. So I mentioned abattoirs because it's an issue here. Our, our people that raise a couple of sheep or pigs or whatever, they have to transport them for about 400 kilometers to get them uh, processed. It's not good for the animals. It's not good for the, for the landscape. We need to actually start diversifying our processing facilities for all sorts of crops to adjust to this multi-species type uh, environment. 
I think so I'm just going to sorry. I'm just going to jump in there. Sorry, um, you've got another couple of minutes, and then we then we need to move to Q and A. Sorry, yeah, that's I know fine. You've got I'm lots nearly, to cover. nearly there. Um, so we need to support cooperatives. We need to fund more research because, of course, research is being funded by the industry. Particularly, how we can form this resistant carbon, get people to understand it, so that we can do more of that. Um, and then investigate and end the policies that decrease the soil carbon and that you can read there yourself. Now the suggestions, this is in addition to what government can do and what we can do individually, purchase regeneratively farmed products, grow your own veggies, request quality food uh, from your shops, support the farmers who are looking after the health and landscape and really go out there and find out more because like I said, there's not a lot of people who are talking about this and the government isn't gonna care unless it becomes a very significant issue. The, the answer is in our soil. We can um, address climate change by changing how we farm. So, and if you can get into farming um, any way you can. And these are just some references I have. Uh, there's so much being written on this. The, it's really taking off from say five, six years ago when now, oh, about 10 years ago, Vandana Shiva was uh, already pushing this sort of thing. And of course, Alan Savory has been working on it for decades. Walter Yenna, anything you can find by him online, take the hour it might take to listen to what he says and you'll learn so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Di. Uh, that's great. I uh, appreciate um, you sticking to time as well there. That's excellent. We're, we're about... Um, few minutes over where we should be. Um, Michelle, were you just about to say something there? Yeah, can I su suggest we take um, questions first for Davinda, BK and Diane, and then we move into, into questions for everyone. Oh, okay. Uh, and I was we, also we going to suggest- a question. Uh, sorry, just one sec. I was also going to suggest that I would prioritize um, non-Australian questioners if they're, you know, I'm not sure, out of the participants, I noticed that probably not everybody's in Australia, and um, my our Australian colleagues are doing well with the questions. But if there are questions from elsewhere, that's great. Um, Michelle, sorry, did you say there was a question I'd missed somewhere? No, we we, we were going to break for questions for Davinda and BK, but we missed it. So so if we can do questions for Davinda, BK and Diane first, and then we go into generic questions. But if anyone has specific questions on the presentations from Davinda, BK and Diane, if we start there. Ah, uh, thank you. Your run sheet is different to mine. So um, I'm uh, following the latter one. Okay, great. So I will prioritize any specific questions for Davinda and BK. Please indicate in the chat if you would like to speak or put your hand up. I can see both of these things. Not seeing any specific questions arising. So I might just kick it off to, to, to um, on the basis of what I've seen in chat and people are welcome to obviously add as we go. Um, I noted that there was a question um, which probably follows on a little bit from what Diane just said from Will Rees uh, about sort of major obstacles and the transition period and economics. So I'm going to ask Will if you would like to speak. I'll give you the call. And looking at my participants, Will might not actually still be with us. In which case, this is irrelevant. <laughs> Um, all right, I might then swap tracks and go to Ian Oxenford, who was asking about um, the interaction with um, a universal basic income. Has that got a, a particular relevance or connection to um, regenerative agriculture? Ian, did you want to speak to that or ask a question on that? Hello? You're right, uh, you're right now, go. Oh, thanks, Giz. Um, yes, because I, I've been a, I'm, I'm retired. I'm one of those cashed up retirees that I pick on. on the, I live on the north coast of New South Wales, uh, Australia, for those overseas listeners. Um, we, we have an, several young people in our area who uh, 
struggle on trying to do the sorts of things we're talking about, organic farming and, you know, what they, they interpret as regenerative agriculture. And they, and they struggle with, with cash items, school fees and just, well, medical things and all sorts of things that you need money for. And I've often thought that the universal basic income has a, has a, a very, um, would be a very appropriate way to assist people to live or move from cities and live a satisfactory lifestyle in rural areas. I don't know what other people think of that. Hmm. That's all. That's it. Does it, would anybody like to comment on that? Uh, yes, if you allow me. Uh, I think that's a, very, that's a very important uh, question. And in fact, uh, the uh, farmer movement in India, I think, uh, uh, raised that uh, particular question because they are saying that uh, farmers also need income for sustaining their families, bringing up their children, taking care of the health expenses and all. And in my studies and my experience, I have seen that uh, agriculture, the way the global economic design has been worked out, agriculture has been deliberately kept uh, impoverished. Uh, let me be very clear about that. So when we talk about uh, saying that we need a healthy planet, we need healthy agriculture, we need healthy food, yes. Yes, uh, for sure, but we also need wealthy farmers. So I think what the what the uh, farmers are demanding or what the farmers are asking for, not only uh, in, in India, but I think in Australia, in, in uh, uh, the European Union, America and Canada, is that they need a guaranteed income, what they call as a parity income. There was a massive protest for income parity in America in 1979, a tractor protest in Washington, D.C., but uh, the government didn't uh, listen to it, and we now know so everywhere in the world, farmers are, are faced with distress and uh, uh, whatever they are, you know, those who are surviving are actually surviving on government uh, support or subsidies or making it on their own uh, uh, conviction. So I think um, this is a this is a definitely a very serious issue for the for the globe to ponder on that we need to change these economic policies. I remember one of the American uh, for farmer leaders saying some years back that uh, they are tired of subsidizing the nation, which means providing cheap food for the people. I think. Uh, that's a task that government uh, have burdened uh, farmers with over the decades and uh, farmers need to really uh, emerge out of it. And that is only possible if we get a living income for farmers. Uh, you know, we, we want transformation to take place. Yes, it is possible, but we also need to assure that uh, farmers are, uh, you know, assured of a living income and uh, which means a guaranteed income, living income, whatever you want to call it or an assured income. But uh, this has to change. The entire economic design has to change to ensure that the farmers are now uh, at the center of it because so far it has been, everyone has been exploiting farmers and the protest in India was actually focusing on that if the, because that was against the market reforms that the Indian government was trying to introduce because in my understanding, and I've been saying everywhere that market reforms everywhere in the world have failed to prop up uh, farmers' income. And I think we need to change that economic design to see that uh, farmers also are as uh, uh, you know, uh, important a section of the society in the terms of income parity as others are. Thanks, uh, Dev. Um, I note that Richard has put up his hand in a very disciplined way. Excellent. Richard, I'm going to um, uh, give you the floor for a question. Can you hear me? Hello. Oh, good. Go. OK. Um, well, I. I, I... Tremendous presentation from everybody. Thanks ever so much. Really very pleased to see this. Um, I've made a few points on the um, commenting. My main question is, what is it going to take Can anybody else hear Richard? I'm sorry, I think we've lost you. <clears throat> try, try again. Can you hear me? You're right now. Can you hear me? Yes, go. Okay. Um, what, what will it take for the federal greens to adopt much of what we've talked about today as a core policy? Because it's the core policy upon which everything we rely depends. And there's no point in pushing for this policy and that policy when we don't have a planet to live on. Because as um, 
the gentleman Devin from, from India has pointed out, land is being degraded and some areas of the world is no more than about a couple of generations, if that, of good growing seasons. So we don't have much time. So when are we going to take it on board? When, are our, when is our leader in this party going to take it on board and put this forward as a policy which will help people who are out there worried for the future, actually really scared about the future for themselves, their children, their children's children? What, when are the Greens going to actually grasp the nettle and do something? Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Richard. That's great. Um, I'm just kind of um, um, uh, put a pause there um, because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm minded that a lot of us are in Australia and we're talking about Australian Greens policy. Um, the, you'll note there was one response in the chat box there, but I'm wondering uh, maybe, Diane, would you give a brief response and then I'll go to the next question. Yep, and I'll be brief. Richard, I'd love to talk to you about this because, as you know, Green's policy is developed from its members, so our members have to be louder about it. So if you can get a few more members to be seriously interested in this and start talking about it within your local group, then get to your state group, also become part of the country Greens working groups in both your state and the federal, uh, the AG country Greens, we need the numbers. We need people to be saying this is really important over and over. But as I said, it's not a big popular issue out there in the uh, whole of Australia. Um, it's it's taking time to get that developed, but we all need to be very vocal about it and get involved. Thanks, Diane. Um, I'm going to um, try again to see whether Will um, is able to speak. I think you were saying you had some problems with your technical side. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sounds good. Hi, yeah, so my question was just, um, uh, having spoken with a lot of farmers about, you know, these sorts of methods uh, that are being um, talked about, especially today, uh, a lot of them, you know, come up with uh, issues such as that in my region, for example, summer uh, crops aren't that easy to plant, which are, uh, generally um, part of a lot of regenerative agriculture methods proposed um, and uh, other issues about um, moisture levels that are required to enable a lot of these methods. Um, and are these actual obstacles or uh, is this just um, an education program that needs to you know, go out there? I mean, not in a patronizing way, obviously, because these people know how their land works. Thanks, Will. Um, I might ask um, uh, Zach, do you want to respond to that and then we'll see who else might like to say something? Yeah, you know, I think there are very real issues about um, understanding the pieces involved and the best strategies. You know, it's easy to fall into this attitude that we're just going to come up with a recipe and that recipe is going to work everywhere. Absolutely not. We need a custom solution that's in line with the land and the context. Um, so, uh, you know, the specific issues that he pointed out, I am 100% sure there are really good solutions to them. Um, but I also have no doubt that with the information that farmer currently has, they see that as a hurdle that they can't overcome. So I really think it comes around to education. And it's very important to not do it in a lecturing manner, because that's going to turn people off, but just to prevent them, present them some new information um, and some new things that they could do. Thanks, Zach. Uh, B and Pete, do, would you like to add something? Yeah. Um, he, um, Will, I think you mentioned moisture, not enough moisture. Yeah, I think you need to adjust depending on the region, but also what we've been involved in is actually rehydrating the landscape with plants, with all plants, um, and uh, in a most efficient and effective way by expanding the riparian zones within the landscape to increase the um, yeah, the water holding capacity and what you can actually put on top. And uh, there's also uh, methods we can learn from the Eastern um, countries, uh, such as, I guess, um, Korea, China, uh, they, uh, they change uh, depending on the year, they change the type of plants they're planting. So if there's a wet period, you plant wetland plant, wet plants that like wet 
and then if it's a dry long dry period in Australia sometimes for years you, you change that but it's not something that we've really been teaching or learning in Australia. And of course Indigenous agriculture um, is the foundation uh, and that's been doing that for like millennia and um, if you're in a north area like dry tropics is kind of what I was imagining there's some case studies up there that we could also refer you to. And in terms of training, I mean, there's training out there in terms of rehydrating the landscape in Australia specifically, that is town park training. They're probably the primo providers uh, in America, SAC Vice. <laughs> yeah, so. Thanks, so, thanks very much. Sorry, didn't mean to, to, to interrupt there. Uh, Di, did you have a, a word on that one? Sure. Um, it's the, the difficulty is you're talking with people's behaviors, their psyche, their sense of self. And that's what the, it's like trying to get somebody to change their religion in some ways. This is what they've been doing for decades. For somebody who's new to the whole thing, who's not a farmer to come in and say there's answers, other answers, it's difficult. It's almost like they have to see it over the fence. They have to see it when they go to the pub and chat with somebody or the cafes or when they travel and online. They've got to hear it from a number of different places. But yes, finding those, those plants to plant in the summer is a tricky one, but there's a lot of research going on there. And you have to remember that weeds will grow in the summertime. So there's going to be some plants that will grow with the limited amount of rain we've got. And it's not like you're trying to get a crop out of that. You're trying to have it covered so that there's not so much less uh, evaporation, but that also as the temperature cools in the evenings, it can draw in the moisture from the air and funnel that back down to the roots. So plants on a, bare land, on a landscape through summer actually keep more moisture and get more moisture into the soil. Thanks, Ty. Now I'm going to just take take the liberty to just make a couple of comments myself. I think one of the things is that um, obviously, as Di has said, who is giving the message and how frequently they're hearing it about this move to regenerative agriculture and looking for champion farmers. They are the best people, obviously, to talk to other farmers. Um, and farmers particularly are, are, are um, quite conservative in that way. Uh, and I note that in the chat, there's been a comment that we already do have uh, a, I think a good policy position on uh, regenerative agriculture in the Australian Greens uh, policy suite. Um, it's probably the issue of um, how high up the agenda we can, we can get it. And that's going to be more relevant to certain parts of Australia than necessarily uh, in, in the city. Um, I have one more question which I'll take and then we need to move to uh, Michelle to outline the follow-up. Um, and the question was, I've just lost it. Let me see it again. Um, uh, from Sam Hales. Sam, do you wanna give that a go? You should be able to speak now, Sam. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, I've lost audio, so I will just ask the question then. Um, so how does regenerative ag animal agriculture specifically compare to industrial animal agriculture in terms of land use? And what does that research indicate in terms of current global consumption versus needed land? Great question. And I am going to give, <laughs> I might give the speakers 30 seconds each on this one. I'll start with Dev. Dev, do you want to respond to that? Well, I think this is a question which is being asked uh, uh, again and again, and uh, how does uh, the regenerative agriculture or ecological agriculture compare when it comes to the uh, global food production? There are several studies on this, and uh, one study which I would like people to refer to is the IAASTD, which was done several years back, and which, uh, of course, India is also one of the signatories, which says that business as usual is uh, not the way forward. There are many other studies which have told us, which have given us this message very clear, that there is uh, no drop in uh, food production. Some, of course, uh, point to that uh, the, for a couple of years, there is a drop in uh, the food productivity, 
uh, crop productivity, but eventually uh, you will see in the long term, it is uh, beneficial to go for uh, regenerative agriculture or as I said earlier, non-chemical uh, agriculture. So there are enough evidence available for it. And as I gave the example of Andhra Pradesh in India, the productivity has actually gone up from 10 to 110% uh, across the spectrum. And I think that tells us clearly that uh, this, uh, this uh, impression that is created that the world would have not enough to feed itself is uh, something which is being just created to uh, basically to create a fear psychosis. Uh, by, by the lobby so that, you know, people don't move to that kind of agriculture or discard uh, the inputs that are coming from the from the uh, industry. So I think, uh, let's be very clear, there are clear examples that uh, we can do it. And there are very clear examples also, uh, which need to be developed on or worked upon as to the income increase and the other benefits that we normally don't talk about, uh, which means uh, the health uh, advantages, uh, the advantages as, as compared to water, soil, what we have done to soil regeneration and so on and so forth. So I think that costing needs to be done. And the best way to do is to look into the true cost uh, accounting being done by the uh, by the global initiative called TEEB, uh, the Economics of Ecosystem uh, Services of Biodiversity. I, th I think that's another study that uh, we must uh, focus on and see where we can. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Dave. Right. That's great. I'm sorry to cut you off um, because I am uh, not being a good facilitator and I'm afraid the other um, panellists, I, I can't give you the call um, because we do now need to move um, to Michelle, who is going to outline <coughs> follow-up actions um, and uh, then we'll have a, a final video from B and Pete uh, and then we'll wrap the session. So, Michelle, you have the floor. Thank you and thank you to everyone on the panel. Um, this is a global green session and global greens is in over 103 countries and we do tend to have focused on just a couple today, but that's okay. Um, what we would like to do is um, have a regenerative agriculture group within uh, the global greens community um, and to keep people informed. And to work on this, we'll be working more asking like the African Federation and the European Federation, which is the wrong time zone for them. We're one of the first sessions of the conference, so we're on the wrong time zone. And double thanks to BK and Devinda for their very early morning start today. <laughs> but um, we'll, we'll try and build it up with people also from Latin America. Just a very quick observation. Um, I've worked all around the world on every continent on sustainable agriculture issues and where you get change quicker is where you have small scale farming, such as India, where you have tens of millions of people farming or parts of Latin America. Where you have high level industrial agriculture, like in the US, Canada, Australia, and Northern Argentina and Northern Mexico, you have the changes much slower because the agrochemical companies have a huge foothold, huge you know, amount of money that goes into to lobbying and buying and a lot of corruption issues, of course, as well. So, so I would just like to say for those people that come from the large scale industrial countries for agriculture, um, a lot of change is really happening um, in sustainable farming in those countries at a smaller scale level, but also um, in many of the other countries and now in India moving to massive, massive scale. Also just a quick shout out to the farmers of India. There've been a huge resistance very radical resistance to the agrochemical company. And at the moment, there is a big fight going on there from the government with, with Modi trying to stop the power of the small scale farm and bring in, bring in big agri-business, agri so which ch changes the entire food supply, of course. So um, final pitch, if anyone would like to stay involved, I've taken down note of the um, emails that have come in so far. So if people would like to add any uh, your your name on the list there, we can stay in touch on developing this further. And we're always able to have some Zoom calls. From talking with Pete and B, we have a great speaker lined up for a future possible webinar who you just might want to introduce, um, speaking about climate mitigation and how um, regenerative agriculture can really help in, help in those issues too. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to be in Pete for the final video and um, hopefully we all stay in touch. Thanks everybody. Namaste. Thanks Michelle. Okay, be in Pete. What, where you go? Oh, okay. So it's Professor uh, Justin Borowitz and um, he's talking about carbon drawdown.
he's a biologist um, and he looks at climate and biology and agriculture and the interconnectedness of all of these things and more. Um, he's a senior professor down at ANU, the Australian National University. And uh, he's originally from San Diego. He's been through uh, many, many different stages in his career, but he's been really looking at the whole of landscape approach, which starts with ecosystem restoration. We're now in the UN decade on ecosystem restoration by 2030. Um, that there's a major effort there. And so how does that happen while we're being increasing productivity in our farmlands, um, restoring uh, ecosystems, building biodiversity, and uh, uh, achieving some sort of climate recovery. And that's what this video is, just a really short video that um, introduces him on his journey. And we'd love to uh, be a part of a future webinar with Justin on the call as well. So thanks very much for everyone uh, for being here and Elle for that um, opportunity. And thanks, Nick, if you could play the video. Thank you. I'm Justin Borvitz, Research School of Biology at ANU. I'm excited to be at Peter Andrews' newest project here today in Mongonia, and we're seeing what he's done after uh, a couple years. I think we need to better manage our agriculture lands in extreme climates of the future, and certainly we need good scientific advice to the government, and hopefully they listen. There's a lot of challenges to balance. Food security is important, but climate security is ultimately possibly more important. What's also on the table at Glasgow and the COP is negative emissions or carbon drawdown. And the only way to pull down carbon that we've emitted in the past is called negative emissions, but photosynthesis is probably the biggest one that our land actually cycles 10 times more carbon than humanity emits in a year. And so having some resilience in the system, soils that can hold water, vegetation that can respond to the floods is really key. And we'd like to capture more carbon in the land than we release. And good land management that holds that soil longer can be a big part of the solution. We have to demonstrate it, and that's up to farmers. You know, not necessarily optimizing for cash in the near term, but investing in their ecological infrastructure and their natural capital. And a big part, I think, is regenerating the landscape. So we'll see what happens in Glasgow, but if we come up with some good rules to manage land systems, then we can get soil health and resilience, which we need for adaptation regardless, as well as some mitigation to bring down CO2 in the long run. Excellent, thank you very much. Look, we're, all, we're going to finish almost exactly on time. Um, and can I thank you all very much, particularly our panelists for the excellent work uh, in preparing and uh, presenting today. A huge amount of information um, and excellent uh, keeping to time in a disciplined way, which is very challenging on a, a Zoom meeting. Um, thank you very much to our participants as well. Um, there's been round about 20, 25 people uh, participating at all times um, and for your questions um, and thank you for being part of the Global Greens and the work that we all need to do together, which is so important.